Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is resolving trade disputes, and specifically we're interested in answering the question of how can international courts settle these sorts of disputes. I'm going to start off by talking about a few facts, which are really review points from the last few videos in this unit on trade. So first is that trade can provide mutual benefits. Essentially, by trading with one another, we can specialize in the products that we're best at making compared to the other products, and this will create a surplus of extra goods that would not exist if we were just producing goods by ourselves. And so that means we can divide this surplus among or between two countries, and that will leave both countries better off than had they just decided to work and produce goods on their own. However, some of these agreements are more beneficial to one side than the other. In other words, I could take more of the surplus and leave very little of the surplus to you, or on the other hand, you could take most of the surplus and very, leave very little surplus left over to me. And this creates some tension here because failure to agree on how to divide this surplus of goods means that we're not going to have any trade at all, and therefore we're going to have no additional benefits at all, and we're going to be worse than if we had come up with some sort of agreement that would have involved trade and gains from mutual trade. All right, so that's a bad thing. We want to avoid these sorts of trade disputes, if at all possible. How are we going to do that? Well, one way that the international system has come up with a manner of solving this sort of issue is to have international courts. And so specifically, the World Trade Organization, which is the world's biggest trade organization, as the name might imply, has these sorts of international courts that settle disputes. So if two parties are in a dispute, they'll come to the court, they'll make an argument, the court will make a ruling. And what's interesting is that the states will generally abide by the World Trade Organization's court's rulings. Now, why is that interesting? Well, this is a bit of a puzzle. So World Trade Organization courts have no true enforcement mechanism. This isn't like a court in the United States where if the court says I'm guilty, that I have a choice on my own to decide whether I want to abide by that court's ruling or if I just want to run away to Canada. When a court makes a ruling in the United States, there's a police force that will actually enforce that ruling. So if I'm told that I'm guilty of murder, then the police force is going to come and take me to jail. And, you know, absent some crazy thing where I'm running away and no idea, the police have no idea where I am, that court ruling is going to be enforced. But these world courts don't have a world police force to enforce these rulings. So if it's the case that most of the time individuals or states are actually abiding by these court rulings, well, that's a bit puzzling because there is no actual enforcement mechanism uh, to, to actually create these rules and implement these rules that the, the courts are deciding on. And so why is it the case that I am going to follow these court rulings, especially if the court rulings aren't exactly the way I wanted them to go? So essentially put differently, and to summarize that, if states live in anarchy, why don't we just ignore the courts? And to explain why states might not ignore the courts and actually follow the court's rulings, despite the fact that the courts have no enforcement mechanisms, I want to draw a parallel to a classic story in game theory. It's called the Battle of the Sexes. So in this game, there is a man and a woman, and they want to get together for an evening of entertainment, but they have no means of communication. They know that they can either go to the ballet or the fight for their date. The man prefers going to the fight, the woman prefers going to the ballet, but the interesting thing is that if they don't end up together, they'll both have to go home unhappy. And that means that if I know that the woman is going to go to the ballet, I as the man, despite the fact that I would prefer going to the fight with my date, I would rather go to the ballet. So I'd rather have my second best outcome as a date with the woman at the ballet than to go to the fight by myself. Because if I go to the fight by myself, if the woman isn't there, I'm just going to have to go home. And that's going to leave me sad. So the way that these payoffs work is that the man has a most preferred outcome, oh, yes, of going to the fight and having the woman meet him there. And the second best outcome for the man is for the woman and him to go to the ballet together. And if they mismatch, if the man goes to the fight and the woman goes to the ballet, or the man goes to the ballet and the woman goes to the fight, that's equally bad for both parties. In contrast, the woman most prefers being at the ballet with the man, then second most prefers going to the fight with the man, and of course, if they mismatch, then she is just really sad. So there are mixed motives in this game. You really want to go to the form of entertainment that you want to go to, and you need that other person to be there with you. So given coordination, given that we'll either be at the ballet together or the fight together, the man wants to be here and the woman wants to be here. So there's some strategic tension here, knowing that if we fail to coordinate, then we end up in this really bad outcome for both of us. 
All right, so there are two sustainable outcomes here. First, if we both know that we're gonna be supposed to be going to the ballet, say we actually talked about this ahead of time before we left for work that day, we said, hey, you know, at 7 p.m. we're gonna be meeting up at the ballet. Does anyone have incentive to change what they are expecting to do? Well, obviously the answer is no. If we're expecting to be at the ballet together, the man isn't going to randomly decide to go to the fight, or the woman isn't going to randomly decide to go to the fight, because if she does that, well, now she's not meeting the man there, and so that's worse for her. She's getting a zero as opposed to a two, and so she's going to want to stick to this idea of going to the ballet at 7 o'clock. And likewise, if the man were to randomly switch to going to the fight, the woman's not going to be there because she was expecting to go to the ballet. That's what they had agreed upon earlier in that day, and so she's going to want to stay to the ballet as well. All right, well, if they both agreed that they were supposed to go to the fight earlier that day, then again, you have the same sort of situation where if the man switches to going to the ballet randomly, he's going to be worse off. He's going to get nothing as opposed to two. He was in a better outcome right there when he was going to the fight with the woman. And likewise, the woman's not going to want to switch over because if she goes to the ballet, man's not going to be there. That's going to be bad for both parties. And so she's going to want to switch back or keep going to the fight as she expected to. So that's in a world where there's good communication. Without communication, it's not really clear how we're going to meet up. Are we going to go to the ballet together? Or are we going to go to the fight together? And without a coordination mechanism here, we could very well end up in these bad outcomes that are worse for both of us, that we really want to avoid it if all possible. And so to summarize here, this is a coordination problem. The man and woman have incentives to cooperate, but have opposing preferences on how to cooperate. So this is what we call a game of mixed motives. There's this incentive to cooperate, but there's also this incentive to have a bit of an argument over how to cooperate. And so you need some sort of means of resolving the coordination problem that assures us that we won't end up in one of these outcomes that's bad for both parties. And so, you know, if we're talking about we had, we had an agreement at 7 a.m. to meet at the, the ballet or the fight at 7 p.m., if we had that sort of agreement up front, then we would stick to it, right? And likewise, if there was a rule of thumb that Friday nights are fight nights, Sunday nights are ballet nights, and tonight is a Friday, then that's a coordination mechanism for us to both know, despite the fact that we haven't actually communicated directly with one another, that we're supposed to meet at the fight. So rather than having some uncertainty about whether we're supposed to be at the ballet or at the fight, we know that tonight is Friday and so we should just meet up at the fight. And of course, that leaves us better for both of us than if we randomly decided to go to the ballet. Okay, so that's why coordination is really helpful and coordination mechanisms can ensure that we don't end up in really bad outcomes but we can do something very, very similar with trade. So this could be a trade coordination game. It doesn't have to be this battle of the sexes argument. We could instead look at this in terms of California and Mexico over, or who are arguing over two different trade agreements. There's trade agreement X and a trade agreement Y. If we agree mutually on a trade agreement, then that trade agreement's implemented and we get the associated benefits of that trade agreement. If we disagree on the trade agreement, then we have no trade and we are both as if we are just producing on our own and we're not gaining any benefit from the surplus, okay? So you'll notice here that we have mixed motives once again, where we obviously want to agree on some sort of trade agreement because no trade is bad for both of us, but California prefers this trade agreement X because that's going to give more of the surplus to California. And some of the surplus does go to Mexico. It's better than if there's no trade agreement, but California really likes this agreement as compared to this agreement down here, where if they both agree to agreement Y, Mexico is actually the one who's winning more. It's getting two points and California is getting one. So this is just the same battle of the sexes setup. I just changed the story and changed the players and changed it from a game of meeting up somewhere to a game of how to agree on a particular trade outcome. Okay, so that's that's clear. We should also still know that there are two different outcomes that are sustainable. We could both agree to agreement X or we could both agree to agreement Y. That's going to be good for both of us. If we know that we're supposed to be agreeing on agreement X, we're not going to be switching over. Or if we know that we're supposed to be agreeing to agreement Y, we're not going to be switching strategies either. The problem is, however, that we don't really know, perhaps, which agreement we should actually try to coordinate on. Should we try to coordinate agreement X, or should we try to agree on agreement Y? Obviously, California is going to want to try to get this one, this agreement X, to be the outcome, and Mexico has the opposite preference. It's going to want to try to get agreement Y to be the outcome. Now, imagine that there's an international court out there, and the international court listens to the arguments from both Mexico and California and ultimately decides agreement Y should be enforced. 
Well, if that's the case, imagine you're in California and you know you didn't really like agreement Y as much as you liked agreement X. What are you going to do in this situation? Are you going to sustain this agreement? Are you going to keep going with this agreement, agreement Y, what the international court said? Or are you going to want to change your strategy? Well, given that Mexico is going to be playing agreement Y and is expecting that agreement Y is going to be what's going to be enforced, it doesn't make sense for Mexico to switch its strategy because Mexico is getting its best outcome. If it's switched over away from what the international court ruled, it's going to get nothing as opposed to two. And so Mexico is very happy to stick with agreement Y. Same story for California, where California is getting one from Agreement Y, and while that's not as good as if the international court had ruled on Agreement X, California by itself can't really change its outcome or change its strategy and expect to do any better with its outcome. So if California switches over from Agreement Y to Agreement X, it goes from one to zero, and that's bad for California. And so California is actually has incentive, despite the fact that the international court ruled against California, to actually follow that ruling of the court. And so if you need some sort of means of resolving coordination problem, courts can co coordinate expectations and resolve this sort of inefficiency where if we don't know how to coordinate, we're going to end up in this no trade outcome and things are going to be bad for both of us. So despite the fact that courts will rule against one party, you still actually have incentive to follow that court's ruling and avoid having no trade at all. And so that's how international courts can resolve coordination problems and actually get states to listen to their agreements and listen to their rulings despite the fact that they have no enforcement mechanism and states do in theory live in a state of anarchy and could just simply ignore the agreement or ignore the ruling if they wanted to. So that's pretty interesting and uh, a pretty useful understanding of how court courts and international s institutions can sometimes affect outcomes despite the fact that again they really have no sort of enforcement mechanism or enforcement power. All right, that wraps up this video on trade and resolving trade disputes. And we have one more lecture left in this unit on trade, and we'll talk about how trade and gains from surplus can affect coercive bargaining. So we've been talking a lot about trade before. We'll now somehow mix and match this idea of trade and surplus with what we talked about in the last unit on conflict and war. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.